She's like a sickness in my brain. A vision standing by the window pane. She ripples through the blinds and leaves me in a daze. It's in the way her body moves me. The way she grabs me and intoxicates. Until the signals in my mind forget to operate. Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So we are in our new recording space. For the most part, it's completely done. Let me know if the sound is better because we have completely tried to soundproof this whole area. Let me know if the glare is gone. I've tried to fix all of the things that bothered or bugged you guys in previous videos, the sound issues and glare on my glasses that made me look like a creepy demon. Before we launch into the video, I want to talk to you about our sponsor for this video, Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a new documentary streaming service that offers so many more options for documentary lovers. And I assume if you're here and you're watching this channel, you're a lifelong learner like I am. There are over 2000 documentaries on Magellan TV and they're adding more all the time. And I'm sure that the majority of these documentaries you haven't even seen yet. I know I haven't even seen them yet, which was a big draw for me because I've kind of exhausted all my documentary resources, the History Channel, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime. I was definitely looking for a fresh infusion of documentaries and I found it in Magellan TV. On top of that, the price is so good. I thought at first the quarterly price was a monthly price because I truly feel that the quality and the mass of documentaries that you have to choose from of all different topics is really worth $17.97 a month. However, Magellan TV is only $17.97 a quarter. I really like that I can start a documentary on my TV using my Roku and pick it back up on my tablet or my phone if I have to go to the gym or if I have to be on the move. And that $17.97 price gives you access to every single one of their documentaries uninterrupted without ads. There's no limited access like on Hulu lately. I've noticed if I want to watch a certain program, they're like, no, you can't watch this program. That's for Hulu premium members. There's no premium members at Magellan TV. You pay your monthly or quarterly fee and then you have access to every single program that they offer. I watched this documentary called Murder on the Internet and it's, it's so good and it's so interesting. It says, now more than ever, dating can be a dangerous thing. Dating is getting incredibly risky in this modern age where technology is opening up a new way for murderers to hunt and kill. Strangers can easily hide behind fake profiles and webs of lies. So that's pretty much what it's all about and it's so intriguing. I don't want to spoil anything. I don't want to give anything away in case you want to watch it, but it's so intriguing and so interesting and I think it's perfect for people who love true crime. Additionally, there's so many history documentaries on there and you guys know I'm a huge fan of history. I just watched um, a documentary about Catherine the Great called Ekaterina and I also watched another one called The Last Days of Anne Boleyn and I'm a really big fan of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and Catherine of Aragon, that whole time and that whole time period in England, I'm a huge fan of and very interested in. So guys, check it out. Go to the description box, click on the link, and the first 100 users who come from my channel and use that link will get their first month of Magellan TV for free. Okay, let's get right into the video. So the first thing that I want to talk about today is actually a case that happened in July and I've kind of been keeping an eye on it to see if more information came out. Sometimes I like to talk about things with you guys on Coffee and Crime Time right when they happen, but if they happen and things seem to be a little sketchy or it seems like there's spaces where things don't make sense or people's stories aren't adding up. I really like to kind of let it flesh itself out before I talk about it with you guys. That way I'm not giving you really inaccurate information or I'm not kind of telling you a story that has so many gaping holes. So the event actually happened to this past July 26th and it happened in Rome, but the suspects were actually two Bay Area teenagers. One was 18 and one was 19 and they both graduated from the same high school in 2018. A police officer in Rome named Mario Rego was stabbed. Now some of the sources that I read say he was stabbed nine times, some say he was stabbed 11 times, but there is no actual evidence as to whether it was nine or 11. So we're just going to kind of say he was stabbed quite a few times. 
And these two teenagers from America who were in Rome on vacation, they were arrested for their involvement in his murder. Now one of the boys was named Finnegan Elder, we're just gonna call him Finn, and one of the boys was named Christian Gabriel Natalie Heworth. Now you know I always struggle a little bit with pronunciation of names, so we're just gonna call them Finn and Christian from now on to save us all the trouble of hearing me struggle to pronounce names. So this happened at about 2 a.m. in Rome. Mario Rega was pronounced dead by 4 a.m. And like I said, in the beginning, there was some question about how this happened. Why would two American teenagers go to Italy and stab a police officer? Why, why would they do that? If you're gonna commit a crime and you're a violent person, you probably don't wanna commit a crime in a foreign country because then you're gonna be held in a foreign country and you don't feel like you have the rights that your country provides. So allegedly what happened is Finn and Christian met up with a, a pusher, a drug dealer essentially, and they gave him money for drugs, but he didn't give them drugs, he gave them a different substance. And once they found out that he had given them something that wasn't what they paid for, they basically stole his backpack which had his phone in it. And when he called the phone to ask them where his backpack was, they told him that he had to give them 100 euros and a gram of cocaine or they weren't gonna give his book bag back. So this drug dealer guy, he goes to the police and he's like, they, they stole my book bag. I don't know how this whole conversation went because it's very strange for a drug dealer to go to the police and be like, hey, I'm a drug dealer and these kids, they bought drugs for me, but I didn't give them drugs. I gave them something else and now they're mad and they stole my stuff. Can you help me get it back? Like, I just cannot imagine how that conversation went, but that's what he says happened. He went to the police. He told them what happened. They had him call Christian and Finn and set up a meet so that they could give him the book bag and he could give them the 100 euros and the gram of cocaine. But actually the police were gonna be there in a basically sting operation to you know, get these two teenagers and arrest them for stealing this guy's book bag. So Mario Rega and his partner, Andrea Varali, they are the police officers that are called to the scene. And what Andrea Varali says happened is they showed up, they showed their badges, they identified themselves as police officers, and then Finn basically attacked Mario Rega and started stabbing him, and Christian started attacking um, Andrea Varali. So they were both, you know, attacking these police officers. Andrea Varali also said that he was armed at this time, which led to the question that some people had for him was if you were armed, how did this happen? How did these two teenagers get the jump on you? So the police who are investigating this stabbing at first, obviously they don't know who Christian and Finn are because they're not from the area, they're from out of the country. So what they do is they pull surveillance footage from stores that were around so that they could get an idea of who the suspects were. And then they were able to track them to the hotel that Finn and Christian were staying at, the Meridian in Rome. The police claimed when they arrived at the hotel to arrest Christian and Finn, the boys were getting ready to leave the country. They searched through their hotel room and they found the knife, the murder weapon, hidden behind a ceiling tile. They also found the clothes that had been worn by the boys during the attack on the police officers. So they were subsequently arrested, they were brought into the police station, and the police claimed that after some interrogation, they both confessed, even though their stories differed and they kind of turned on each other a little bit, which I think is to be expected when something like this happens. But then a photo uh, was released or leaked and circulated around showing Christian who was being interrogated or was about to be interrogated and he was handcuffed and blindfolded. So obviously then a lot of people had an issue with that. Okay, he's a suspect for a murder, but innocent until proven guilty. What is the point in blindfolding him? even before or during the interrogation. The police claim that he wasn't blindfolded during the interrogation, just before, and they are trying to figure out who the responsible party is. They say they don't know, and they're kind of distancing themselves from the act. They're, they're pretty much saying somebody went rogue and did this without, without their knowledge or without actual permission to do so. This then provoked a member of parliament in Italy to go to the prison where they were being held in order to make sure that the conditions there were, were good and they weren't being mistreated essentially. And he reported that although there's no air conditioning, they're being held in cells with no air conditioning, they're being held in separate cells, but they're each being held with another prisoner who is foreign but does speak English. 
he also says that there's fresh fruit in every cell, so fresh fruit available to the boys, so they're being given nutrition at least. The prosecution also claims that the boys were under the influence of drugs and alcohol when the murder happened. However, they did not take blood samples from either Finn or Christian that night, so they have no way to actually prove whether or not they were intoxicated or using drugs. Now, obviously, these boys have gotten lawyers. It looks like, if, I, if I'm correct, at least I know Finn Elder has a lawyer in Italy as well as one in the States. And I do know Christian has one in Italy. I don't know if he also has one in the States. I couldn't find anything to support or contradict that. So we're just gonna go ahead and say that Finn for sure has a lawyer in Italy and the United States. And his lawyer in the States has pretty much come forward and started talking to the press about all the discrepancies in the stories. Andrea Varali, remember he said that he had been armed and that they both had shown their badges and identified themselves as police officers. When in fact, both Andrea and Mario were dressed in plain clothes, so they weren't wearing uniforms. Additionally, Andrea did not have his firearm on him and it didn't look like Mario had his badge on him. So the boys claim that they're meeting this drug dealer to make this exchange and then these two guys come you know, running up dressed in regular street clothes. They did not identify themselves as police officers and these kids thought that they were being basically caught in some drug gang thing. Like that the drug dealer that they'd stolen from had called his buddies to basically attack them and kill them. So they felt they were being threatened. So that's why Finn pulled out the knife which they had brought for protection and started stabbing Mario and Christian attacked on Andrea. So now they're doing an investigation into Andrea Virali to see why he was dishonest about how how it all went down, why he didn't have his firearm on him. Obviously that goes against protocol, especially Mario Rega not having his badge would go against protocol. The Italian media says this investigation into Virali is just a formality, but obviously it can be used by the defense as a strategy. Elder's US attorney says that the boys version of what happened that night is gaining support as it is the only one that makes sense. So I guess I wanna ask you a couple of questions and, and let's discuss it in the comments. What do you think happened here? And if Christian and Finn thought that the police officers were in fact just you know regular guys working with the drug dealer and going to attack them, would it justify them stabbing and attacking the police officers. I mean, even though the police officers didn't take blood tests, I think it's fairly safe to assume, and it's an assumption, that these boys were probably on something when they attacked these police officers, considering that they, they were buying drugs from this guy, or maybe they were going through some crazy sort of withdrawal because they didn't get the drugs and they really needed it. I'm not sure about their history or their background. Let me just tell you, it is speculation. Finn does not speak Italian as far as I know. Christian does speak Italian pretty well. His grandparents actually own a beach house in Italy and he was on vacation with his family in Italy when this all happened. Finn and Christian did not travel to Italy together. They had had known each other previously, even though Christian's father says that he's never heard the name Finn Elder and he doesn't think that his son and Finn were that close. They're probably just acquaintances considering they went to the same high school. They were both in Italy at the same time. Finn called Christian to meet up. Christian spent a couple nights at the Meridian, which was Finn's hotel room, and then they got into this, this scuffle and this issue and this crime together. So were they feeling a little bit on edge, possibly being in a different country, feeling unsafe because they were doing something illicit and illegal? Maybe grabbing this drug dealer's backpack was kind of a spur of the moment, impulsive thing, and then they were like, crap, you know, we're probably gonna get in trouble with this drug dealer or he's probably gonna bring guys with him to like attack us. So that's why they brought the knife because they were preparing to be attacked by the drug dealer and his buddies or his cronies. So they already kind of had that in their mind when they went to meet him. And when these two police officers who were wearing street clothes came out, they just assumed and jumped. I do not think that Christian and Finn would have attacked Mario and his partner had they known that they were police officers because it's kind of a stupid thing to do. You're really, especially being in a different country, you're not gonna wanna kill a police officer because you're pretty much never gonna leave that country. I mean, after the Amanda Knox thing and the Italian police lost her, they're not gonna let any other Americans come there and mess around and, and kill one of their own and then let them walk back to their country free and clear. So let me know what you guys think about this and we'll keep an eye on it. There apparently, um, at least I know Finn is petitioning for a release and that's gonna be heard on September 16th. The lawyer, Finn's lawyer is trying to get the 
surveillance footage, which is the, the same footage that the police used to figure out who had stabbed Mario Rega. And they're trying to get that so that they can prove what happened. And from what I from what I gather is the Italian police aren't really handing that over willingly. So maybe it does show something that they don't want Finn's lawyers to see. But that's once again just speculation. Let me know what you guys think. At the end of the day though, no matter what happened, Mario Rega was the victim here. He lost his life. He was 35. He was handsome. He was healthy. He was happy. he just gotten married the month before he was killed and his funeral was held at the same church that he was married in, in his hometown near Naples. So that's really what we have to keep in mind here. Somebody lost their life and whether it was a misunderstanding or a purposeful malicious act, it's still a loss, especially to the people who know him. And it's sad and, and that's who we have to remember and keep in mind. I often feel like the victims and their lives are lost when we're talking about these crimes and we're trying to figure out what was the motive of the suspects or the killers. Uh, why would they do this? What exactly happened? We need to know everything about this story. We need all the facts and evidence when really what's important overall is Mario lost his life and his, his wife, who just married the man of her dreams, the man she loved, is now a widow, a young widow. So that, that's incredibly sad. Next, we're gonna talk about something horrific that happened in California this past week. Leaders of a non-denominational church based out of El Centro, California, called Imperial Valley Ministries have been charged with using dozens of homeless people as forced labor. So Imperial Valley Ministries claims its mission is to restore those grappling with drug addiction at free faith-based rehabilitation group homes. It also raises money to open churches and rehab centers in other cities, and they do have churches and centers in other cities. They have some in, in the United States, and they also have some in Mexico. Most of the alleged victims were from outside of El Centro. They would bring people from as far as Texas and they would basically tempt them and lure them in with the promise of a warm bed and free meals and they would, they would take care of them until they could get back on their feet and then they would pay for them to go back home. When these recruits were checked into the group homes, they were required to sign papers that stated they could not discuss things of the world. And the only book that they could read was the Bible. And if they broke any of these rules, there would be discipline involved. This discipline would end up being the withholding of food. And in one case, a diabetic woman who let them know that she had low blood sugar and she needed insulin and she needed food, they withheld that from her. So once they got to the center and they signed the paper, they would have their driver's licenses taken from them, their passports taken from them, their immigration paperwork taken from them, any form of ID, social security cards. They also took their EBT cards if they were getting welfare benefits. They took their SNAP benefits and they, they actually, it looks like they used them for other people. So I don't know if they were selling these people's SNAP benefits to other people because I know that that happens, but they're charged with using those things inappropriately or improperly. And they were basically locked in these group homes and the windows were nailed shut. They were told they could absolutely not seek outside work and they were forced to panhandle six days a week for up to nine hours a day. And whatever they got while they were out panhandling, they would have to bring it back to the church. And the church said, if you don't do any of this stuff or you try to escape or you tell anybody, we're gonna have your children taken from you. Now, in my opinion, there is so much more to this than meets the eye. There's so much more that we don't know yet, but I, I can obviously speculate in my head and I'm not gonna do that out loud yet um, just because it's so early. They have 30 churches across the United States and Mexico. They've basically been building this empire where in my opinion, it appears that they've been taking advantage of people for quite a while and benefiting monetarily off of other people. And these aren't even rich people, right? These aren't even people who are middle class or comfortable and they're just tricking them into donating a lot of money. These are people who are struggling in life, who have a very 
little of, if anything, of their own. And these people are tricking them and saying, come in here, we're, we're God's warriors, we're God's helpers, we're going to take care of you because that's what God would do. And we're going to feed you and get you back on your feet so that you can go back home to your family and, and be a functioning member of society. We're going to help you. We want to help you. They're tricking them, they're bringing them in, and they're taking literally everything from them. Everything. And if you remember correctly, when we talked about Jim Jones and the People's Temple in, in our cult series, and I'll link that in the description box if you haven't seen it yet, it's a very good one. That's exactly what Jim Jones did. Jim Jones pretended he was a man of God. Jim Jones pretended he wanted to help people, and then he'd literally have them sign over their entire lives to him. Now I'm reading this KTLA article and it says that Imperial Valley Ministries was no fly-by-night operator. They were known in the remote desert region for decades of work helping drug addicts turn their lives around. The ministry operated a ranch for men, a group home for women, and a small headquarter office on one of the busiest streets in El Centro. Residents could be seen at intersections wearing burgundy t-shirts with the ministry's name emblazoned in white letters, asking idled motorists for money and giving them a brochure about the ministry's work and a choice of peanuts or candy. It became so successful that it established a network of about 30 affiliate churches across the country in cities as far flung as Charlotte, North Carolina, and Las Vegas. Now this says that the rule sheet that they had to sign says you can't leave the house unless accompanied by someone and with the permission from the director, never by yourself. You can't go to the front yard unless told so by the counselor. Victor Gonzalez, the ministry's 40-year-old former pastor of Brownsville, Texas, his 39-year-old wife, Susan Christina Livia, and 10 others have pleaded not guilty to crimes including forced labor and benefits fraud. The defendants allegedly confiscated magnetic striped cards that are used for supplemental nutrition assistance program, which is SNAP commonly known as food stamps. Five defendants in El Centro were found to be in the country illegally and denied bond because they were considered flight risks. No one responded to phone and email messages left Wednesday with the ministry, and it was unclear if the defendants had attorneys. So Christopher Tenorio, who's an assistant U.S. attorney, he claims that the founding members of the church. Uh, they're all basically elderly now, so they handed over the reins to Gonzalez in 2013. He was actually a resident at that point. And when they did that, that's when the abuses began to escalate. But it doesn't say that the abuses started in 2013. It just says that they began to escalate. So we really don't know how far back this goes. The church was founded in the 1970s. So this church, they would recruit their, their members or the people they were trying to help by going to all these faraway cities, far away from California. And that's when they would find these homeless people or these people who were in great need. It looks like some of these people were immigrants and they would bring them into their white vans and say, we're gonna drive you back to California, we're gonna take care of you. Now the reason, in my opinion, that they went to faraway cities when they could have just stayed in California there is a lot of homeless population in the LA area, in California in general, there's homeless people there. So they could have gotten homeless people who would fall for this right in California, but the reason they didn't do that is because they wanted to isolate them from people they knew. They wanted to take them away from their hometown so they didn't feel comfortable, so they didn't feel like they could just leave and run into you know, their parents while they were out panhandling for the church. They wanted to isolate these people and get them as far away from home and people who knew them and loved them. And they told them, your loved ones have abandoned you. They don't care about you. This is the only place you have. God loves you. God will take care of you. Nobody else does or will. And if you ask people who have been involved with the ministry what they think about it, you're going to get people who are on complete opposite ends of the spectrum. Some people are going to say, they helped me so much. They helped me recover from addiction. They were great. And then you're going to have other people who say they're a cult. Essentially, they're a cult. They're terrible. They're greedy. They just want to steal from you. It's bad. So what's, what's the end result or what do we take from this? I'm not sure yet. Like I said, this is still developing and I have ideas in my head that this is more widespread and it gets bigger and there's more to it. And we're gonna see how far this web of deception stretches and how many different areas of illegal activity it touches. But I won't speculate much more than that. That's gonna be it for today. Guys, Halloween is coming up. I'm so excited. I have been preparing 
and working tirelessly to get all my research done for the videos so that way when October comes all I have to do is record and edit and have uh, three to four videos up for you a week. I am so pumped and if you don't know what Halloween is it's a whole month of October extravaganza where we're talking about true crime and mysteries and things like that that have a creepy kind of annotation and vibe to them but are based historically on fact and, and and truth and evidence so i'm not going to come here and tell you ghost stories even though that would be super cool uh, but they'll feel like ghost stories because they're going to be so crazy that you're going to say this can't be real but it is. So if you are excited about Halloween, give me a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed and you're interested in being here when we when we have our Halloween party for the entire month of October, please go ahead and subscribe. I've never asked anybody to subscribe before. Like I've never sat on my videos and said, make sure you subscribe. And people have kept telling me, you need to like tell people to subscribe in your videos. And I never do because I feel like you better subscribe. I feel like it's weird. Like I'm, I'm demanding you to do that. But if you want, to watch my videos, then please go ahead and subscribe and hit that notification button so that YouTube lets you know when I post. Now I have my Halloween shirt on right now and this is gonna be one of the shirts available for Halloween merch. The Halloween merch is going to be available as of today when this video posts. So I'll put the link to that in the description box and you can go check it out and see if you wanna get your Halloween merch so we can all be wearing our Halloween shirts together while we're talking about Halloween stuff. So I'm gonna stand up and show you what it looks like full screen. So for Halloween, I really wanted this like Edgar Allan Poe, the Raven kind of spooky vibe. And that's why we used this old fashioned typewriter with the page coming out that says Halloween. And you'll see when Halloween starts that this really ties in to the videos. The other shirt that will be available is the Murdery Vibes one. I have that shirt too, but I'm not wearing it. I'll wear it next time. I'll put a picture in here for you so you can check it out. And the third design is something I say in almost every video. At the start of the video, I say to understand what happened at the end, we have to go back to the beginning. And I think that's valid, not just for the cases we talk about on, on my channel, but life. I think it applies to life because really to understand why anyone is the way they are or why anybody goes on to do the things they do. We have to go back to the beginning, to their childhood, to their life before you knew them and before you became aware of them. But I think it's a really cool design and it's very true to what we do here and my channel and our community. And I love these designs. I'm super excited to be wearing them. I'm super excited for Halloween. So I've gone on long enough about all of this. Check out the Sleuthany shop if you're interested in your Halloween merch. There's also going to be my other merch there, allegedly, and the Don't Come For Me and all of those. I'll reopen those as well if you haven't gotten yours yet. But I will see you very soon. I'm excited for Halloween. Stay kind and stay beautiful, and I'll see you next time. Bye.